So, hello and welcome to Truth You Can Wake Up To. My name is Samuel William and it is the 20th of July, 2012. Sorry, I'm going a bit crazy because obviously uh, the world has turned into a police state. Uh, I'm going to go out uh, in the next few days and hopefully take some photographs. Uh, uh, there's not much on the internet that shows you the level of the police state that is in central London. Take it from me, it's crazy there. <laughs> really, really is. There's army. When I saw my first uh, army man, after we heard that uh, the army is going to be used uh, more heavily, I mean, let's face it, the army were always going to be there, ladies and gentlemen. 13,500 of them were always going to be there. Just because it's been added to now by several hundred doesn't mean we weren't going to see the army. And when I saw my first army, man, you know what he was doing? Can you guess what he was doing? He was standing behind and guarding a locked gate. <laughs> Is that not why we have locks and gates? So we don't need an army man to stand behind it and guard the lock? I don't know what they were expecting to happen. Somebody to come up and see the army man, but then still break through the gate? I, I really don't know what they're expecting to happen. Plus, it was in St. James's Park. It was in, like, uh, there were ducks there. There were pelicans there. There was uh, some uh, quite a lot, quite a couple of squirrels and stuff. Uh, I know that they can be quite unruly. I think the squirrels actually could probably breach that fence and then probably evade the the army. I'm not sure if that's why they're there, but I can't really think of any other uh, uh, risks they could possibly have in a in a royal park. Now, this whole G4S, what is proclaimed to be a, in air quotes, scandal, is of course not, in air quotes, a scandal. And that's because it is being paraded in front of our eyes and... The whole security arrangement in the first place to do with the Olympic Games and the Olympic Games itself, most probably, is, in fact, a psychological operation. Psychological operation? Is this guy on crack? What is he talking about? Well, they have talked, the, uh, the government and uh, the local London Council, uh, the, the office of Boris Johnson, uh, the Metropolitan Police, the Royal United Services Institute, all of these people have been saying that the Olympics will leave a security legacy. Legacy. But, of course, people won't just accept the army being on the streets. They need to be given a reason. If they're given a reason then they don't have to think about it. They can just go, ah, oh, that's why they're here. Seems to make so much sense. And my thesis in this episode is that G4S are playing a role in this psychological operation. So don't believe that there's a psychological operation going on before our eyes. Well, listen then instead to a Mr. Michael Clark of the Royal United Services Institute. All of this is necessary because some of that necessity is for reassurance and deterrence. So psychology is all part of it. So psychology is all part of it. So psychology is all part of it. 
the obvious threat, of course, is terrorism, which is what we were worrying about four or five years ago. But since last year, I think another area of threat are um, various anti-government protesters, people who've learned that they can make a big statement by uh, public demonstrations of some sort. And if, if anybody tries a stunt, if anybody tries uh, a, a real spectacular around the Olympic site, they won't get through and it will be very dangerous to them. That's the message. Now, the, uh, that was um, Michael Clark. And the Royal United Services Institute is a think tank. He is the uh, the director of that think tank that does certain things for military operations. So essentially, what did he say there? He said uh, anti-government protesters. It's a bit of a strange thing to say, isn't it? Especially if you are a person who runs a think tank that works on strategy for the military. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Now, exactly what are the links between the government and G4S? Are there any links? Well, of course, G4S uh, provide a lot of services, uh, in inverted commas, in this country. What services do they provide? Is it just security, bouncers, and stuff like that on uh, various government buildings and nightclubs? No, actually, considerably more than that. Get an uh, earful of this. Um, they train the British Army. Sorry, what? Yes, they train the British Army. They do UK border enforcement. Uh, they do electronic tagging uh, that goes hand in hand with their um, operations with all with our prisons uh, they run prison officers and prison services <laughs> prison services they also do perform police functions this is just brilliant wording isn't it police functions they do cash transport. We've all seen those vans. They do risk assessment for the oil industry. Now, this is uh, an interesting one. They do risk assessment for the oil industry, which helps the oil industry to reduce costs. They reduce costs by assessing the risk. Hello, the BP oil disaster. Do we remember how they were reducing costs and didn't have proper risk assessment? They do uh, barrier entry for public transport. So when you go through uh, barriers for the train, they also do airport security, seaport security. They do a thing called mining solutions. Mining solutions. They do secure parcel delivery. They do offender rehabilitation. They run child services and children's homes. They run immigration services <laughs> and they tag them yes they do and they tag prisoners yes they do and now they tag alzheimer's patients who get lost they're just starting to tag hello anyone rfid do you think this could be the company that will eventually try and introduce rfid Especially if they just happen to be performing police functions. Do you think RFID chips attached to everybody would improve the efficiency and the risk management of police functions? But I think the most important thing there is they train the British Army. The British Army decided that it was more cost-efficient to get G4S to perform some of the tra routine training tasks. Hmm. Hmm. Now, Theresa May, she's been in the uh, news quite a lot because she's been defending G4S and defending the government's position with G4S. Is it possible it's because she owns shares in G4S? Does she really own shares in G4S? Surely not. Well, no, but her husband does. <laughs> now, what about uh, the police? Obviously, they're going to. Uh, they were planning on uh, privatising the uh, the Metropolitan Police, and now they've said that the uh, that, that privatisation will be suspended, not cancelled, but suspended. 
Um, is there any connection between uh, any any corruption there? Uh, possibly to do with the contrast? Yes, actually. A man called Sir, Sir Paul Condon, who uh, was uh, the chief commissioner of the Metropolitan Police for many years, now retired, taken a chairman position, or is on the board uh, of G4S. Ah, oh, what a lovely, lovely, loving little family they have down there in Whitehall and uh, around New Scotland Yard. Brilliant. They might as well just get uh, Boris Johnson to start wearing a G4S badge, and he can be the G4S mayor. Of course, they've had old uh, Nicky, Nicky Buckles. Old Nicky Buckles has been up on the television being told off by members of parliament and the select committee. They brought him up. He's the CEO of a private corporation. Yet somehow they're trying to convince us that G4S has some kind of national obligation. Um, we've had a fantastic track record of service delivery over many years uh, in many countries, um, but clearly this is not a good uh, position to be in. But we feel we've got to you know, make every endeavour to deliver as well as we can on this contract. Mr uh, Backles, it's a humiliating shambles, isn't it? It's not where we'd want to be, that is certain. It's a humiliating shambles for the company, yes or no? I cannot disagree with you. Mr. Backles, no, I wouldn't have thought you would. Never really before have I seen such draconian behaviour from news agencies and MPs and such a, a, a guy that's just sitting there with his eyes blinking like a little rabbit, a little, little tanned rabbit. It's, it's, it's really strange. But, of course, now we do have the army in London. And in fact, the army are everywhere. Now, let's face it, there were going to be 13,500 army personnel in central London doing things like security checks and, uh, at, check and uh, at barriers and all this kind of um, malarkey. That is what they were going to be doing. There's going to be lots and lots of army. Now, the general public could be uh, forgiven for thinking, hang on a minute, there's army within my country. Are these not train killers? Are these not well-trained elite psychopaths um, who are trained to kill and not think about empathy, but to just kill? Should they be milling around with the public and with children and all of that kind of stuff while they're on duty? Should they? Should they really? They could be forgiven for thinking that. And now they're not going to be thinking that. Now, when they see the army, they're going to be thinking, thank goodness the army are here. Because G4S, that naughty, naughty, privately owned supernatural, <laughs> supernatural, supranational company has failed us, has failed this wonderful country of, oh gracious queen, oh great G4S has failed us. Once again, but don't worry, the army are coming in and they're going to sort it out. Thank goodness the army are there. I mean, I'm not worried that we have uh, trained psychopaths um, checking our bags and filling us up. I don't mind because that G4, that naughty, naughty man, Mr. Nicky Nicky Buckles, has been naughty. And the select meeting, good, has told him that he's pathetic and his company is pathetic and they should do something about it and not be so very, very naughty. And even Boris... Mr. Boris Homer Simpson Johnson, who is the law, uh, he is the mayor of Greater London, Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris Homer Simpson Johnson has said, uh, said just previous to this, in air quote, scandal, that uh, the Metropolitan Police were going to be privatised by G4S. And then, of course, this scandal happened almost instantaneously. He said, oh, we're going to have to suspend the privatisation of the Metropolitan Police by G4S. Suspend. Suspend. Not cancel. Suspend.
And believe it or not, the psychological operation that we're falling under here to worship guns and security is not just limited to the army, the police, and G4S, those are those, those uh, corporate thugs. No, it's also being done to the general public through music. Yes, music. Because as we all know, music makes the people come together. Yeah, and the, uh, and the people did come together uh, to the bottom of Hyde Park the other day. Uh, lots of people converged onto Hyde Park, which was like a mud bath filled with mud. And what were they going to see? Well, they were going to see Madonna with a gun. That's correct. Madonna had a gun. The dancers around her had guns. At one point, she was sitting sort of legs apart on top of a crucifix with a gun to her head. Yes, because suicide and sacrifice is really, really cool. I mean, she might as well have just cut her wrists and gone, look, blood, blood, can you make blood come out of your body? Look, blood's cool, suicide's cool, Why don't... and guns are cool, security's so cool, security, security guns. It's so brilliant. Go down to the Olympic Stadium and ask the army man if he can pose with his gun and maybe shoot his gun because that's really cool. And especially if he shoots it at people or maybe shoots himself and the other people in his military detachment. That would be brilliant. And just across the road from that muddy and mulchy and smelly performance that was coming from Madonna, you have the Hilton on Park Lane, which is a, a very, uh, uh, it's like a high-rise hotel that has now been turned into, like, the Olympic Hotel. And you've got those fleets of BMWs that have been seen all over London. These BMWs go on the Olympic lanes, and they're to ship around the athletes and the dignitaries and all that kind of crap. And... They're everywhere. It's like a car park of them, £27,000 each on behalf of the uh, uh, of the taxpayer. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone's getting shipped around. It's all really great. They've got an iPhone application where they just say where they are. And before they know it, uh, a BMW turns up cutting through the traffic. And uh, they've emblazoned the Hilton on Park Lane with all these huge things. There's a massive security operation going on there. Uh, and it says on the outside in massive letters... Inspire a generation, which apparently is the the Olympic slogan. Slogan. It's a slow gun. Slow gun. And inspire a generation by putting up everyone involved with the Olympics in one of the five star hotels in London, shipping them around for free in a fleet of BMWs costing twenty seven thousand pounds each. On behalf of the taxpayer, inspirational, I think you'll agree. Very inspirational, inspiring a generation of taxpayers. So, just in case I haven't yet quite convinced you that uh, G4S is servicing the New World Order and is somehow deeply ingrained in the plan to create a police state, then maybe this little nugget of information might interest you. Good old tanned ex-butliner Nicky Buckles is in fact the chairman of an organisation called the International League of the Surveillance Society. Yes, and here's their logo. Note for a little while, it's got the, uh, it's got sort of a UN -y sort of circle there. One on the circle with the uh, little branches. It's got the Illuminati triangle. And what's that in the center? Oh, it's a six pointed star. So you may want to uh, look these guys up. Um, it's the Ligue Internationale de Société de Surveillance. And why? is some ex-butler in a tanned root boy called Nicky Nicky Buckles. What's he doing being the chairman of such a strange organisational society? Well, he took over 
from the head honcho. These are some of the pictures uh, from uh, their various meetings. You notice the flag with that lovely symbol on it. Look how they all wear sort of... Look how they've got the sun symbol above and they they worship in a temple. And uh, they look very much like a secret society. Does it not? And you can look them up. They uh, are essentially the, the an association of security professionals. And they have, you know, various... Uh, objectives uh, to to name just a few that says uh, this is from their own website uh, under objectives of the league it says one they are a supranational organization and the end in view is the solution of common problems difficult or insoluble at a national level and the that means na national boundaries equals rubbish. <laughs> and I carry on. And the development of techniques and organizational methods more effective than those possible to individual initiative and local resources. The animating idea throughout being to improve and increase the overall potential of private security activity in the world. I'll, I'll repeat that last bit. The animating idea. We are animated with the idea that we must improve and increase the overall potential of private security activity in the world. Supranational private world security. Hail, hail, hail. The League. Now... Nicky, Nicky, Nicky Buckles is the chairman of this supranational organization. You may want to look that up. Possibly. Did I also mention that, by the way, when they say they're withdrawing from Iraq, we're withdrawing from Iraq, they're not withdrawing from Iraq instead no they're going to be replacing the soldiers that are withdrawing from Iraq with guess what da, 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 da. G4 S ex military gathered together paid 5000 pounds a month to uh, and given lots of guns and they are now protecting Iraq and also did I mention oh sorry Afghanistan, and uh, you can go through various ex-military forums, and you do a quick search for Afghanistan and G4S. You can find all the people that are saying, "I'm getting a job in South South Helmand Province, and uh, we're going to be giving we're going to be given um, HK G36 Cs and Glock 17s." Yeah, man. With mag holders and plate carrier, if you want to own a blue one, it's applied to you in Kabul. Dun, 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 dun. And they're just boasting about the weapons they're being given and the duties. They want the army to withdraw because then they can get the jobs. G4S in Afghanistan and Iraq and probably soon to be Libya and maybe in Tunisia, and maybe in Egypt, and maybe in Lebanon, and maybe in Turkey, and maybe in Iran, and maybe elsewhere. Maybe in a town near you. Maybe on stage with Madonna. Maybe in a private BMW with the Olympic rings on the side, or protecting your family at the Olympic Beach Volleyball. So the episode's now drawing to a close. I just want to illustrate one more crucial point, and that is one Sir Honourable, the right Honourable David Cameron has said that he thinks that the English national sporting anthem should be Jerusalem originally from a poem by William Blake. Now, Jerusalem, um, if you read the words, it's all about, I will take my chariots of fire 
and uh, I will not rest and the sword will not drop sleep in my hand until Jerusalem has been built on England's green and pleasant land. I will play it for you in a, in a moment in, uh, in, in double quick time because it's, it's more fun that way. And you can see some of the lyrics, really, really quite scary. And for anybody who ever thought that possibly, did the Olympic logo say Zion? Did it? If you've ever been any in any doubt, you won't be after you uh, link together Mr. Cameron's comments and the lyrics from that anthem. And uh, just to give you a sort of little thing about William Blake, I, I, I thought, oh, is it possible that William Blake saying all of these things about uh, about Jerusalem and building it beneath, uh, between the satanic mills of England's green and pleasant land. Is it possible that he may have been a Freemason? And this was just an open question. I thought I would Google, and I did a quick Google for it. You can Google it yourself, and you can find out. But uh, I put in, is, is William Blake a Freemason? And this is what it came out. I thought possibly he might be. He might have been a Freemason. Well, and this is what it comes out. Blake is remembered as a poet and a painter, but in his time he was not considered to be an artist. When he became apprenticed in 1772, his master engraver was James Bazier, who lived at number 31 Great Queen Street. Now, Great Queen Street, for those who don't realise, is where the Grand Lodge is, the Grand Masonic Lodge of England. It was founded in the late 1700s. So he lived on uh, uh, Great Queen Street, opposite the Masonic Grand Lodge. Quite a few of Blake's friends would enter Freemasonry, although there's no record that Blake ever joined. Blake's biographer, Peter Ackroyd, states that Blake never joined any organisation, but according to the lists of Grand Masters of the Druid Order, Blake was a Grand Master of the Grand Masonic Lodge from 1799 till 1827. For about 30 years, he was the Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge. Of course, such lists are often grand claims with little substantiation. Still, when he lived at number 28 Poland Street between 1785 and 1790, the ancient order of the Druids convened merely a few yards down from Blake's house in an alehouse apparently established by the order itself. Too close for comfort? Question mark. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions. And uh, until next time, I have been Samuel William. This has been truth you can wake up to. And I'm going to leave you with Jerusalem.